Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Well, welcome back, Pet Parent. I'm so excited to have you here today for a number of reasons. One, because I've been able to get so many incredible guests lined up for you on this podcast, and I have many, many more to come that uh, I've already recorded, and I'm so excited for you to be able to listen to very soon. But today, today, we have... And it is my honor (laughs) to introduce you to Kat Henschen of Platinum Paws. We are going to be talking today about not just grooming your dog, but fear-free grooming, which if you're not already looking specifically for a fear-free groomer, I think by the end of today's conversation, you will be. So before I get Kat on, I want to introduce her to you and, and just tell you a little bit about her. So Kat Henschen, also known as the Ninja Groomer, has been a certified professional groomer since 2004. She loves working with her clients to get the best look for their pets at Platinum Paws, her salon in Carmel, Indiana. She is an award-winning competitive groomer with her standard poodle, Cozy. Kat is also a former gymnast and remains very active, even competing two times on the hit television show American Ninja Warrior as the Ninja Groomer. Her passion is to help homeless pets find forever homes. She donates her time and resources to provide makeovers for pets waiting in shelters. Kat lives on a micro farm with her husband, BC, and their pets, Cozy, a standard poodle, Carrie Jo, a Shih Tzu, and Luna, a Siberian cat. They also have horses, chickens, and lots of barn cats that have come from local rescues after failing a traditional home life. So without much further ado, let's talk about Fear Free Grooming, and I'm going to get Kat on. Here we go. Well, Kat, thank you so much for being here. I can call you. Can I call you Kat? (laughs) Of course. Yeah, that's, you know, that's my favorite, favorite thing to be called is Kat. So yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, So grooming is something that a lot of people try to do at home. A lot of people take, I mean, you know, a lot, a lot of people still do take their pets in. I, at the very beginning of the illness that we can't talk about, um, (laughs) we don't want to talk about, uh, I, I had, I'm not, I am not a groomer. I've never been a groomer. I don't claim to be, but I was trying desperately to put out content that people needed on at that, at that time it was my YouTube channel. Now I do YouTube and, and rumble, but I put out a couple of videos on grooming your dog at home. Cause I'm like, people need, people need this now because we can't go out. We can't do things. And I look back at those videos and I'm like, Oh, how horrible are they? <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't any, it wasn't like dramatic. I wasn't trying to do any fun cuts or anything like that. I'm like, you know, I just using like the aqua paw to bathe your dog at home and like trimming their nails and, you know, that, that kind of thing. But like, it's, it's a, it's a thing with people, especially people that have, uh, dogs that they purchase from breeders. Like they want them to look a certain way. Right. And for me, I have lots of feelings about grooming, about groomers and <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of feelings. But I'm sure everybody does. Yes. <laughs> as a groomer and an award-winning groomer at that, what kind of tips do you have for people first off on choosing a groomer? Like what should they be looking for? What kind of questions should they be asking? Should they be looking for references? You know, like what, what, what all goes into that? Sure. Sure. I'll just tell you my experience and how I like to handle uh, situations where I'm dealing with someone new, new clients. Um, I have, I'm, I'm an open book. And I will stop everything that I'm doing 
in the moment, if somebody comes into my shop and they want a tour of my shop, they want to see behind the doors, we have windows so you can see back anyway. Um, and I'll give the, I'll stop what I'm doing, put my dog away, even on my busy days. You know, I'm not necessarily happy about it, but I'll do it um, because I want to be transparent. And I feel like that's something you need to look for in a groomer. They should want to be transparent, nothing to hide. Yes. I feel you, if you're going to come here, you need to trust me with your dog, but trust is something that is earned. It's not just given. I mean, it's, it's given, but it's also earned. So that's why I'm an open book and I will bring clients back to show them the bathing room and, and explain the bathing process to them because different grooming shops have different ways of doing things. And then I'll show them the grooming area. I'll introduce them to every single groomer that works for me. I'll introduce them to the bathers. I'll let them see, you know, how dogs are being handled. Uh, if they have questions, they're more than welcome to ask any questions and I'll answer them as candidly as possible. Sometimes I've been accused of being a little too candid, but I'm not going to sugarcoat things. I have learned over the years that just gets you into trouble. So I'm going to tell people how it is in a nice way, in a professional way, but you're going to get the truth from me. So, um, and sometimes that, that can be a little bit of a, a challenge for people to accept. Um, but I have found ways to, to get through that and, and to communicate because you have to learn groomer speak translation into customer speak because there's, there's a difference, you know, from what customers understand and what groomers understand. And me being a business owner and a groomer as well, I kind of have to be that advocate for both sides and the go between between my groomers and the client sometimes. Because groomers, I know you said you have your feelings, lots of feelings about groomers, as do I, uh, but I am one. So you know, we're, we're special people. Um, and I, the best way I have found to describe it is that we're talent, like groomers are talent and they're artists mm -hmm. and you have to treat them like that. So you have to understand that talk and talking to them, they're artists. So you want them to be able to express themselves and, you know, work with the dog clients on the other hand, want what they want and and they want to be taken care of and if they're not happy then you need to find a way to talk to them about it and communicate back and forth and learn what's not happy by asking questions and not getting defensive and being open to changing things so say a customer isn't happy with something that one of my groomers have done has done i'll go to the groomer and i'll say hey what do you think about maybe changing this or that or that i mean she the customer was, you know, really happy with how you handled Fifi, but she has a couple of things that she wants to tweak, you know, let's, let's just talk about it, you know, throw some things out there and uh, let's get your opinion on how we can do things different for Fifi. And that way it kind of gives them an in on getting their artistic view heard, but it also gets the client heard at the same time. Um, if that makes any sense to you, I don't know. Yeah, and I really appreciate that that side that I hadn't really thought a whole heck of a lot about is that, I mean, it totally makes sense to me that a groomer, a professional certified groomer, is they're, they're an artist, mm -hmm. and, and, and that totally makes sense to me. And you probably get so many varying types of customers. I'm the type of customer that I care, I care less about the cut itself and more about how my dog is handled and treated, you know? And so you probably have like so many different types of customers that is like, what do I have to do and prove to myself to this particular customer? Right. And that's absolutely the case. You know, we've been in business for 18 years and I've seen kind of a shift over the years in that kind of scenario where it's, it is more of a, compassion-based situation for the owner and not as, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, where all they care about is the looks. Yeah. Um, 
because I mean, don't get me wrong. I still have those customers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have, I have customers that would be more horrified if you screw up their dog's haircut over cutting their dog, like a pad or something. Um, but I, I do see how over the years that has shifted somewhat to where um, they aren't as vain anymore and they're more open to hearing what their dog goes through in the grooming process. Um, but that falls on the groomer's lap too, because a customer isn't going to know what goes on back here unless we tell them. They might assume, they can assume a lot, you know, oh, you get to play with the dogs all day. Mm -hmm. It just must be such a fun job. And, and yeah, it's a great job and I love it. And I put my heart into it and it's, it's a passion of mine. And, but it's not always fun and it's definitely not easy. <laughs> it takes patience. It takes strategy. It takes endurance. And then it takes patience again. <laughs> And not only with the dog, but also with the customer. And then you got the doorbell going off and you got the phone ring and you got deadlines you have to meet. You have to keep the dog calm. You have to be able to do your haircut you're supposed to do. I mean, there's so many expectations on a groomer that people don't think about. And, you know, and I'm not going to say they don't appreciate because they don't know what they're not appreciating. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I've, I personally have... Um, I offer private grooming sessions <clears throat> for some of my, for my clients it's, it's available to anybody, but usually mostly the people that choose to do it are the dog, the owners that have dogs with high anxiety or they're very geriatric. And I've kind of steered them that way and educated them to that path. Um, and anytime I have one of those sessions, the very first session I ever have with one of those people or one of those clients is that one of the things they always say is, I had no idea how much you do in grooming. No idea. You should be charging $500. You know, for, <laughs> and then you get the people, the customers that have no clue and they're like, $50? My hair doesn't cost as much as $50. And, and, and then it just gets kind of, it can't in the past it was a little bit frustrating but I show grace now because they don't know it's up to yeah. me to be a teacher so I take the groomer hat off I put the teacher hat on and I say things like well you don't get your butt squeezed and you don't get a, a mani and a petty and you don't get your ears plucked and cleaned out and you have a lot less hair to deal with is your hair matted have you brushed it every day because this dog hasn't been brushed in six weeks so you know, you know, and just kind of put it in perspective mm -hmm. in a nice way, but candidly, you know? Yeah. And then they're always like, oh, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would, that would so be my dog it is a private session because she's reactive to other dogs. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing to think about is your dog's temperament, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah, yeah. That's, that's awesome that you, that you offer that. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, it's actually something I just started offering this year. Um, in the past, I've always recommended customers that get to that point, especially with the older dogs, uh, to go to a veterinarian's office to have their dog groomed because if an emergency does happen, there's a vet's on staff, medical team, whatever to handle. Uh, they can also do sedation grooming, whereas I cannot and I, I would not. Um, I mean, I have clients that will give their dogs drugs before they bring them, but I don't touch any of it, you know. Um, but I started thinking, you know, I'm the one that's groomed this dog for 15 years. I'm the one that has the bond with this dog. I'm sorry, I'm going to cry. <laughs> that's okay. I don't, even know, I don't even know why I'm crying, but... Um, it's like your dog too. You're like a sweet mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it hits, it hits my heart because, you know, I, I, I guess I probably humanize it too much and I put myself in their position and I'm like, I'm sending this poor 15 year old dog to some new place. They have no clue what's going to have what's happening. So their stress is going to go through the roof, no matter what that groomer is trying to do. 
Whereas if I can just have these people come to me, yes, I'm going to charge for it. And I'm going to, I'm going to charge a premium because it's my time and it's my experience and expertise. Um, but <laughs> it goes so much better. It's not, a, it goes so much better for the dog and for the owner at that time, because over those years, I have built that bond with the dog and the owner, you know, mm -hmm. my clients are my friends too. Most of them, I'm not going to say all of them, but <laughs> a lot of them are. Um, and they've supported me through my Ninja Warrior time, you know, and, and they follow me on Instagram. And they're always asking about my husband, BC, who has multiple sclerosis and how he's doing. And I mean, so it's like a family. I mean, it's um, dysfunctional at times, but it's a family. <laughs> That's the best kind of business, though, because you wake up every morning and regardless of the struggles, you still want to get up and do it and go see everybody and be with the dogs. And mm -hmm. that's so yeah. Yeah. So just, so I decided this year, I'm going to offer this service. I don't really know how much I'm going to charge at this point, but one of my customers kind of helped me come up with that. She doesn't know she helped me come up with that. Mm -hmm. but she's like, I will pay you $200 to have to do this with me with with Sunny her dog and I was like okay um I'm happy to do that and so we set out on this you know I only do it on Saturdays because nobody else is in here on Saturdays my groomers groom Monday through Friday um so it's just me and the owner and the dog and we do whatever we need to do to keep that dog comfortable and feeling safe and loved and but also get the job done um as best we can and um so that's where i got my baseline <laughs> was from her okay two hundred dollars it's a good start <laughs> <laughs> so that's where i uh i decided to charge two hundred dollars for my private sessions and as soon as i put it out there on social media my saturdays are booked for this month and next month wow. with one or two every single saturday so it's 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 a niche that's out there Mm -hmm. that needs to be filled and I'm happy to fill it. Um, <clears throat> so we work together on, on, on these Saturdays and not only do they get to be a part of the grooming process, but they get to see what their dog goes through. Um, and I'm sorry, and how things are, how things are done in the grooming process and they get to take part of it and help me and be my assistant. And, um, I've had people cry with their dog um, because they had no idea, you know, how skinny they looked when they're wet or um, how much they shake when, when they're trying to stand because they're, uh, they, that's all they've, they've ever known. The dog has been trained to be groomed standing. And that's all. And if you do it right, if you're a good groomer and you train them right, they're going to want to do whatever you want them to do because they want to please you. So 15 years of standing for grooming and that's what they think you want. So they try to do it and they can't. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> I can't believe I'm crying. <laughs> I mean, I guess I can because that's the kind of person I am, but um it's hard to watch, you know, it's really hard to watch. And it's, and it's when you're in a grooming scenario through the week and you have 30 dogs coming in your door and out your door in one day, and you have all of these pressures around you. And then you have this dog that is struggling to stand or struggling to do what, or to get bathed. Um, where they didn't used to be, you know, and you can see that and it breaks your heart. It breaks my heart. So that's why I started offering these things because I, I care, you know, I care about the dog and I care about the owner. Um, and that's what it's about. You know, it's what it's supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about compassion. Um, yeah. In the you know, in the beginning when they're babies, yeah, it's about making them cute and, and all that and, and, and training them how to be groomed. You know, a lot of times people, they don't, they don't understand or realize that the dogs, 
when they're babies, they don't come to us knowing how to be groomed. That's a whole nother yeah. platform that groomers, they don't, they don't get recognized for, you know, mm-hmm. um, because you have to teach that dog how to stand on the table. You have to teach that dog not to be afraid of clippers and not to be afraid of dremels and not to be afraid of sharp shears coming towards their face. And it's a process, you know, it's a big process. And if you don't know how to do it, you're going to screw it up. Um, so, I mean, and I, I'm not going to say I'm perfect because I was not. I mean, it took years for me to learn different techniques, different ways to hold dogs, when to keep pushing, when to back off. Um, and one of the things that helped me, I feel like the most was grooming shelter dogs. I groom my shelter dog every week. Um, it's my way of giving back. And I've done it for years and I've had dogs want to kill me. I've had dogs so terrified that you can't hardly look at them. You I've had dogs that are so matted. It's take, it takes multiple sessions to get through it. Uh, And their skin is bruised and their skin is, you know, torn up. Um, but over the years of grooming shelter dogs, I've learned patience. I've learned compassion on a higher level. I mean, I already had those things, but I learned them on a way higher level than I ever had them before. And learning all those things with shelter dogs has helped me approach um, dogs that you know are being brought up in a healthy environment most of the time. Uh, (laughs) um, it helps me learn. It it has taught me how to teach them, um, to be groomed in a more compassionate way, um, and on a deeper level. And I feel like maybe that's why it is so deep in my heart is because I, I put everything I have, you know, into it, um, because I feel like they give me everything back. So they deserve everything. They deserve all of me. And so that's what I give them. Well, so thank you. I, I, I read that in your bio and I actually see some of the posts you do. Um, the, the one you did this past weekend, I think that you posted about, I was like, I couldn't finish the post cause I was tearing up and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people get mad at me a lot because I'm like, cause they're like, damn it, Cassie. Oh, I'm sorry. If I cut this. <laughs> it's you just, I, you make me cry every week. And I'm like, well, I mean, that just it's means reality human. Yeah. yeah you're a human and that's a good thing you know if something is making you cry it's making you cry for a reason and mm-hmm. it's not that's not a bad thing I don't know why society has made it such a bad thing to be touched by something you know it's yeah it hurts <laughs> and it's uncomfortable but yeah <laughs> that's what makes your heart whole so yeah, it's it, I, I, I appreciate what you do. If I'm sure plenty of people tell you that, but I appreciate it very much. I, 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 I wish I need to find something else like that to do personally. Um, I actually started dog training because somebody said to me one day, I, I couldn't even tell you this, somebody I didn't know online. When I was talking about, I used to post like, repost dogs that needed to be adopted from shelters and stuff. And she said, well, what are, what are you really doing to help these dogs? And I'm like, oh man, what am I really doing? Right? Like, Mm -hmm. and I thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. And I said, well, if I can do something to keep dogs out of shelters, Mm -hmm. that, and that's why I started pursuing dog training. Cause I thought, well, that if I can help anybody with their dog, and they don't wind up at the shelter. I, f- I felt like that was doing good, but um, yeah, I used to like collect donations a lot. And since we've moved, I need to find something. So you're inspiring me. To <laughs> find something else. Good. <laughs> you know? But yeah. uh, I appreciate you and what you do. And it's, you've, you've given me a lot more insight into what a groomer deals with also, which I very much appreciate. 
And I know, so we talked a little bit about the different types of clients, and I'm sure there's way more than two different types of clients, but in my mind, I'm thinking you're, you're going for aesthetics and, and, or, I mean, of course you always want your dog to look nice at the end, but like, you really want to find somebody who is going to be gentle and handle your dog appropriate. Like you don't want, of course, accidents happen, right? Like you're going to get the quick sometimes and you're going to, like things are going to happen, but you don't want to ever see somebody manhandling a dog unnecessarily. So like for those, the, the, the people that are all about the aesthetics, I'm sure, you know, groomers probably have a portfolio that you can look at, right? And say, oh, I like that you, I like your the work you do. But for people who are very much concerned about how their dog is handled, what kind of tips do you have for them? What kind of questions should they be asking? What should they be looking for? Mm, that's a, it's a complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so... Let me think how I want to answer this. And it's not that I'm trying to dodge anything. I just want it to be a good answer that's going to help people understand. Um, I feel like sometimes, I don't know. Um, I don't know what people, I don't know what you would be considering manhandling. Are you talking like if somebody's like, grabbing the dog or are you talking if a dog is struggling a little bit and the groomer is kind of trying to, to restrain them a little bit? So I was trying to be, I was trying to find a pleasant way of saying. Don't <laughs> <laughs> be pleasant. No filters here. Just spit it out. <laughs> no, I understand that you have to, there has to be some restraint, right? Because you, right. Oh, oh, a dog wiggling around, you're not going to be able to groom him properly, right. Right. but you don't want to see somebody smacking or hitting a dog. No, You know what no. it is? Like that kind yeah. of, yeah, that's, that's you don't want to see. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what we use in our shop um, is the main tool that we use to help keep dogs in position that is most beneficial to all of us is called the groomer's helper and it's a tether that um, also attaches to the grooming arm so that the dog can't turn or spin or do alligator rolls they might try <laughs> but it it definitely helps uh, assist us in keeping the dog in a position where there's going to be less struggle in the beginning they might struggle more so because they don't realize what's going on. So you kind of have to work them through that struggle and help them face their fears. I know a lot of people don't want their dogs to be afraid and I don't want their dogs to be afraid, but in the grooming world, when they're getting introduced to things for the first time, they're going to be afraid. There's just different ways of helping them through that fear to get to the other side. Um, manhandling them and smacking them around and pushing them that's not the way that I endorse nor is it ever something that I would do but I am going to are you still there no. sorry I don't know what's happening <laughs> I can edit so don't worry about, okay, sorry about that I think my husband was getting a call um on the computer somehow anyway um, so <clears throat> helping them face their fear, um, you have to do it in little doses. Um, you can't just bombard them. And I know that's a, a specific way of training, bombarding a dog with something. I can't remember what it's called specifically, uh, but I know that it does exist out there until they yeah. just, you know, collapse. Yeah. And they're but done. They're okay. Yeah. Yeah. Flooding. I don't endorse. Yeah. Flooding. Yeah. Um, so it's like you introduce them, say they're getting their toenails done for the first time. And we use dermals here and we use the big industrial dermals. We don't use those silly little pet ones because they take too long. They don't do a good job for the grooming industry for pet. Yes. At home. That's fine. Um, and so like, I'll turn it on and just let them hear it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when that happens, they jerk away from you or they, um, they get super scared and you know, they're scared, but I'll leave it on just for a second. 
and I'll pat them on the head or I'll pat them on the side or I'll hold on to them while they're struggling a little bit. I'm not restraining them, I'm holding on to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and just so that they can feel my calmness and my confidence and understand that, yes, this is scary, but this lady knows what she's doing. She's not reacting to my fear. Like my mom might react to my fear. <gasps> oh my God, no, I told you not. It's okay if I don't, which is fine. You're, I'm not saying it's not right to comfort your dog. Of course, comfort your dog. But when you're trying to teach them how to face their fears, you need to find a way to comfort them. But at the same time, continue the process of teaching them how to get it done. Mm-hmm. So I'm comforting them. But at the same time, the journal is still running. So I'm saying, good boy, good boy. It's okay. It's okay. And, or, and then I'll turn it off and I'll let them sniff it. I'll let them smell it. And I'd say 95% of the time, they're all about smelling it. They don't turn away. They don't try to get away where you would think they would try to get away because they were just absolutely terrified of it. But because I've stayed there and I've comforted them and made them feel like, oh, okay, she's no, she knows what she's doing. She's confident. It's just, it's okay. I'm going to go ahead and sniff it. So they sniff it. I let them sniff it. And then I'll touch their, their paw with it. I'll pick them up, make them stand up. And I like, if it's a small dog, I'll have my arm underneath them and I'll grab their foot between, um, in between my arms and I'll touch each toenail with the Dremel. And then I'll stop and I'll put it down and I'll pet them and I'll give them kisses and I let them give me kisses. If they take treats, I'll give them treats. Um, some dogs take them, some dogs don't, it just depends. And, but all of them will take love. <laughs> so I always give that. Um, and then I'll start the whole thing over, turn it on. What happens this time? They just kind of look at it. Hmm, big deal. Turn mm-hmm. it off, let them smell it again, touch all the pads again. And then that's just a way of working the way up to them being okay. So after I get them being okay with smelling it and hearing it and not jerking or fidgeting and actually just standing there, which doesn't take very long, most of the time, if you're starting them off right as a puppy in the beginning and you haven't done anything else to screw them up, (laughs) um, it goes pretty fast. You know, that most dogs are pretty smart and catch on pretty quickly. Um, So after I have done all of touching all the toenails with it, then I'll turn it on and I'll always start on a back foot. I always start on the back left foot. That's just what I like to do. And I'll do one toenail. I'll touch, I'll turn it on, turn it off, touch the toenail, turn it on, dremel one toenail. Most of the time they jerk a little bit, but not, you know, they're not they've been introduced to this. They know what's happening. They've never been touched like this before. So this is a new thing. So that's why they're kind of, what's going on back there? And sometimes they don't care. I mean, it just depends on the dog. And then we just work our way through the feet. Now, if a dog gets extremely stressed, I'll just stop it all together. I'll take them off the table and we go on a little walk outside to get a reset. Yeah. We'll, We'll go in the, in the grassy area, See if you need to go to potty, get some water. I might put you away for a little bit, let you take a break, but I'm going to get you back out and we're going to do this again, you know, because I, it's a give and take between me and the dog at the beginning. And if, if they're learning how to, to do something, if they're learning how to be groomed, it's, and it's like that the whole time, not just for the toenails. So the first time a dog's getting groomed, that's how it is. And that's why it takes so long. So <clears throat> a lot of times owners drop off their dog at the groomer and it's their baby dog and it's their precious baby and they don't want it there very long and we want it as fast as possible. We don't want him to be stressed out. And I understand that. I do. I get it. But we need to approach this from the dog's perspective, not yours. So this is how it happens, you know, and it takes time. Puppies need breaks. Old dogs need breaks. Um, they can't be flooded with everything too much, too, too quickly, because that's, what's going to cause a bad experience for a dog. If you're putting pressure on a groomer to get their dog, their puppy done in an hour or whatever, and still have the expectations of them looking good. That's not, that's not cool. You know, so 
you've got to be open. The customer has to be open-minded enough to hear and the groomer has to be willing to teach and not be a groomer for a second. And so there has to be this open dialogue and this communication of asking questions and answering questions of how this process works. And if you do that, your customer is going to understand and they're going to let you have that dog as long as you need that dog. If you need that dog four hours, that's how long you need it. And they're going to be okay with it because they understand what you're doing for their dog. It's not just about giving a dog a haircut Mm -hmm. or a bath. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more involved in that. And, but it's my job to make, to help, to educate them Mm -hmm. on that. They're not going to know that. And it sounds like there's a lot we can do as pet parents to help you as well, because if we are, if we get a puppy or even if we get an older dog and we start socializing them and we socialize them properly, we should be, we should be providing that, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We should be, uh, at least getting them used to some of these grooming tools And prior to them going to a groomer, um, that would be part of, you know, proper socialization for any dog. So it sounds like there, there's, there's a lot that we as pet parents could do to help you as well. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I, I am known to give people homework. I'm not going to lie, especially with the more challenging dogs or, you know, maybe a dog is coming to me for the first time. And they're three or four years old, but every grooming experience they've ever had has been absolutely horrible. So they're going to be a very challenging dog to groom. And I know that going into it. And, you know, the owner might say they fit somebody or they've been kicked out of so many grooming shops or that he always comes home and he's got bloody pads or he always comes home and he's um, like his face is full of slobber. He always comes home and he sleeps for two days. You know, all of these things that I, you know, all of the, I can ask a ton of fact finding questions in these situations to find out and try to get an idea of what this dog has been through um, so that I can approach it in a way that might, I'm not going to say it always works, but I'm, I'm going to say I have a pretty good track record of working with dogs that have been traumatized in a grooming situation. And sometimes it's not that the dog has been traumatized, it's the owner has been traumatized. And which is understandable. Nothing, yeah, I'm not saying that's not a thing because I, if my go go to a grooming shop and I wasn't a groomer and I picked up my dog and they were bleeding, hell yeah, I'm gonna be traumatized. And I'm gonna know, want to know what the hell happened. And that's where groomers fall short a lot of times is explaining what happened um, in situations because they're scared, you know, Mm -hmm. so they're scared of, you know, making that mistake or being judged for that mistake or rumors or, you know, you know, and they, I'm going to tell you right now, every groomer I have ever met, the first time they cut a dog, they ball their eyes out. They want to quit. They don't ever want to groom a dog again. And it's this whole process that a groomer will go through. So I know I can see both sides of it. You know, I can see where as the owner, I would want an explanation, but I can also see as a groomer, how traumatizing it is to be the one that did that to somebody's dog. You know, of course it was an accident, but you still have to be accountable for it. You still need to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times groomers, fall short in that. And I'm not going to lie about that. You know, I'm not happy about it, but I, you know, I can only be accountable for myself and my grooming shop. Um, and if we have an accident like that, we pay for it. We own up to it. We talk about it. We explain how it's never going to happen again, or what is going to be put in place so that hopefully, you know, won't happen again. Um, and that's all you can do. And I will tell you, I have never lost a client because of an injury ever. And ha- yes, there has been injuries. I've never lost a client because it's how I communicate mm-hmm. and it's how I handle the situation. I appreciate that. I actually, even, even as a pet parent, I'm only responsible for my pets, right? I went years 
without trimming my dog's nails, I would take them to the vet to get their nails trimmed because I, when I tried, I got the quick and I, I was just terrified that I was going to keep doing that. And it wasn't until I took an online course, um, with, uh, a popular veterinarian who specializes in dog toes and I got my confidence and I was like, okay, mm-hmm. I can do it. And so now I just, this just a thing that we do now, right? Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. But, and, and you know, it sounds a lot to me like, um, I, I've talked to uh, my, my people, my followers before about having an, being able to have open communication with your veterinarian. So I've talked about, you know, finding a veterinarian, not being afraid to fire your veterinarian, all the things, and just being able to have a conversation with a professional, like a groomer, right? Like you and open and honest and the, that professional not shutting you down and you not shutting them down like that. It sounds like that's, that's everything, right? (laughs) Like that's what you should be looking for. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. Because, you know, I've actually studied how to communicate with people because I felt like I was falling short, um, in the past on that. Like I felt like Sometimes I would lose a customer because they weren't happy about their dog having to be shaved because they were matted. And so I needed to find a way to educate them better. And I needed to find a way to hear them better. And in my research, the best communication strategy I have found that works for me is anytime I start feeling like I'm getting going to get defensive, I shut it down and I I start thinking, okay, what question do I want to ask? I don't want to make any statements right now because I'm going to get defensive. So what questions do I need to ask in order to learn more about what they are trying to tell me? So that then shuts me down and I'm not trying to talk over anybody. I'm not trying to be heard and not listen. I, I set out on a mission to understand instead of be understood. Mm -hmm. So And I know that sounds hard to do for people and, but it isn't, it isn't. I mean, as soon as you put that practice into place and start asking questions instead of making statements, that the whole controversy goes, like the whole conflict goes away because you're, you're getting the questions answered that you need to know and they're feeling hurt. And then they start asking me questions. So then I feel hurt. And so if some, if, if, if grooming shops could embrace that way of communicating, and I'm sure a lot of, a lot of grooming shops do not saying I'm the only one, I know I'm not, but I do know just from hearing about, you know, different things that have happened in the grooming world, a lot of things could have been avoided if communication would have been better. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. And I, I am getting better at communicating personally. I used to be (laughs) terrible at it. It's it's like anything. It's like a muscle. You have to keep using it and you have to keep trying and then it gets better. (laughs) And you have to practice it. I mean, I, I hate confrontation, but I do it. Because if I don't, I'm going to get backed in a corner sometime. And if I'm backed in a corner, it's not pretty what happens. So I need to take proactive measures to make sure that doesn't happen. Because I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that horrible attacking person. You know, I want to be somebody that finds a solution to the problem. That helps somebody get what they need. You know, and so I just feel like. If you can do that inner introspective look into yourself, then you'll be a lot better off trying to help somebody else or trying to have a successful business or trying to be a successful groomer. Uh, You can be the best groomer in the world, but if you're an asshole, nobody's going to come to you. You know, nobody's going to want to come to you except for the people that are really vain and don't care about, you know, anything except what their dog looks like. And I personally don't want that kind of client. So, but that's me. 
Yeah, and well, that's a good, that's a very good point too. Like you, as much as we can sit here and say, this is what we should be looking for in a groomer, like you as a groomer also have things you're looking for in a client. <laughs> yeah, I do. And I'm, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I have fired clients over the year, over the years that um, have no, don't have the level of compassion for their dog I feel they should have. Um, and it's like, it, I'm not saying it's always been like that because it took years for me to get to that point where I was at that level of understanding and that level of communication and not afraid to confront those kind of people and, you know, putting the dog first and, you know, making sure that it was about the dog and not because I'm afraid to talk to somebody and not because that owner, you know, has, you know, you know, drives a Beamer and has all this money and blah, blah, blah. I don't, I don't care about any of that stuff right in it these days, but I've built my business over the years. So I'm not, I don't know how to say it. Um, in the beginning, I was hungry, you know, really hungry because I had to be. And I'm not saying I'm not hungry now because I am, but I'm hungry for a different reason. And I'm hungry for a different type of client. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you're growing, right? Like, yeah. and, and it's important it's important to, regardless of if you're the professional or the client, to make sure that we're we're only putting the best in <laughs> because you're not going to get the best coming out if you don't put the best in. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> if that makes any sense. But yeah. um, so this may be a tougher question and I completely understand if it is, but if do you have any tips for people who are just trying to get by and make sure their dog is taken care of on their own at home? Like probably not doing, you know, show cuts, right? Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> but just to, in general, of course, you don't want ever want to see mats, right? Like that's poor. Like, I don't think people understand just how, difficult that is on an animal to, to have matted fur. So, but I mean, what kind of tips do you have for people, people like me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to address your, for your first thing about the mats and people not understanding how heavy that is on a, on an animal. I just groomed a 10 year old Lhasa from the shelter today, solid mat. And I uh, had my front desk girl take some video of what the dog was going through while I was having to shave because people think shave downs are easy and they're not. They're super dangerous because you can cut the dog because you're so close to that skin, even with clipper blades. I mean, I'm you're, you're not using shears at this point. You're using clippers, but you can still cut a dog because their skin is wound up in those mats mm -hmm. and the skin can go in between those teeth on the clipper blade um, and then just rip open if you don't know what you're doing. Um, and they leave bruises on the dogs. They leave like the ears were so matted now that they're not matted. They're shaking their, you know, he is shaking his head and the, the tips of the ears start bleeding because they've had those mats so heavy on their ears for so long. It's caused, um, it, it feels funny to them now that they don't have that weight. And then all of that pressure has been released off of that year. So they'll, they'll start, <clears throat> they start shaking their head and it's been, I've seen it as bad where they'll actually get hematomas in their ears, like huge fat hematomas. And there's nothing you could have done different, nothing because they've, they're too far gone. That's there's, you, you can put a headband on them so that when they shake their head, their ears aren't fluffing. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's very uh, heartbreaking. Um, so at home, <clears throat> if you bathe your dog, if it's a lab or a German shepherd or short haired dog, I'm not as concerned. The only thing I'm too, I would really be a stickler on is make sure that you are using lukewarm water. The hose in the backyard in the summertime is okay in the winter time or fall no spring no has to be warm outside if you're going to use the hose um if your dog 
And just a side note, if your dog is swimming in a swimming pool or in a lake, you definitely want to use a hose and hose them down after they're done swimming because in a pool, they're going to get those chemicals. And if <clears throat> when they're laying down, those chemicals are going to um, collect like in their potty patch areas and you're going to see chemical burns. We see that all the time in the summer in their armpits, there's chemical burns. So make sure you're rinsing the dog with a clean water uh, out of a hose if they're swimming in a pool. And then in the lakes and stuff, you get your bacteria and your fungus and your yeast, all that starts growing on the coats and in the toenails and in the ears. Make sure you're rinsing those out really well. Use an ear wash specifically made for ears for dogs. Um, and use it every time they're done swimming. They also make a swimmer's ear for dogs. Um, and that will dry out the ear canal after they're done swimming. We see a ton of ear infections that happen in the summertime because of the swimming. And I am all about letting your dog be a dog and swim, but I'm also all about take responsibility for what needs to be done afterwards. Um, <clears throat> otherwise you're gonna have huge vet bills <laughs> and we don't want that. And you're going to have a dog that's uncomfortable. So just, it just takes a few extra minutes to do those things. Anyway, back to the bathing. So make sure you're rinsing and rinsing and rinsing. Um, if you are doing it in the wintertime or uh, in a cooler weather environment, you hopefully will have a, some kind of setup in your home where you can do a bath in Luke with lukewarm water. Um, Get all the shampoo out. Make sure you're also using a conditioner. Make sure you are using um, dog shampoo. You can use the the baby shampoo or the Pantene or the you know the Dawn dish soap. Um, a cup, you know, every now and then. But the pH is way different in those than it is in the dog shampoo. So it's going to throw off a lot of things in the coat if you're using it all the time. So purchase and invest in a really good, high quality shampoo and conditioner. I like the brands TrapaClean and Best Shot. Those are my two favorite brands. Um, <clears throat> and Best Shot has a really, really fun line of spa shampoos. So you have a bunch of smelly good stuff. Um, so I, I really like those. And... Then also, if it is a, a dog with longer hair, like a golden doodle or burn a doodle, sheep a doodle, those guys are tricky. So you better be prepared to do some work, especially if you want a, to keep them in that long flowing coat. Um, when they're puppies, it's easy because they're smaller, their coats are different. So puppy coats, nice and soft and um, easy to brush through and comb through about nine to 12 months in their coat's going to start changing. And that's when you're really going to have to buckle down and decide whether or not this is really what something you want to put the effort into, uh, because it's going to take a lot of time, a lot of time, every day time is what I'm talking about on those kind of coats. Um, you would want to wash them once every couple of weeks. Um, and after you bathe them, you need to dry them. And if you're gonna do a dog with a long coat, you need to invest in a force dryer if you're gonna do it at home. And those run three to $500 for a good one. You would also wanna invest in a grooming table and they make portable grooming tables. Um, <clears throat> that way you have a way to keep your dog restrained and elevated so you're not wrenching your back. Um, and you can do them on the floor and that's fine. Um, it's just easier if you have these things, these equipment. Um, if you don't want to invest in those things and you want to let your dog air dry, that's fine too. You're not going to get a nicer finish and they're going to smell still and they're going to smell sooner um, because that wetness just mixes with their oils and their skin and then especially in the summertime. I mean, you can wash a dog and they're still going to smell. Doesn't matter. If you dry them properly, they're not going to. Um, brushing and combing. So a lot of times people will just brush the backs of their dogs or the top of the head. And they think, I've been brushing my dog. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have. Yes, you have been brushing your dog, but you haven't been brushing them all the way, 100%. 
So you need to get down on the floor with them or put them on a table and you're going to start systematically, methodically brushing in the head and the face, lift the ears, under the ears, the neck, the throat, the back of the head, brush down the back, brush down the ribs, brush the belly, brush the insides of the back legs, armpits all the way down, outside of the front legs, outside of the back legs, lift up the foot, brush the back of the foot, brush the front of the foot, same with the front leg, do it all over. Then you're gonna comb. You're gonna take a fine tooth comb and you're gonna comb, same method, all the way down the skin, just like you would your own hair. Comb it out all the way to the end of the hair so that you know you're not missing a single mat and everything is being combed out thoroughly. And if you do this on a regular basis, it's going to go a lot faster than if you just wait six weeks and then try to do it. Cause this, it, yeah. It's, <laughs> that's thing you put in brush your hair for six weeks. Right. That's one of the things I see with my clients that um, I go in and train with and they take their dog to the groomers is that they take their dog to the groomers and then they don't do anything. And then they take their dog to the groomers. And I'm like, <laughs> 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 I don't think your dog is terribly comfortable right now, but okay. <laughs> I see that a lot. Um, cause I'm, well, I, I of course I've, I've been very, very open that I don't, I, it's not that I just don't, I don't necessarily feel that my, my tiny dog needs a, a, a grimmer. Um, I think she's okay, but I do, she has longer hair. So I brush her every single day. And I don't, like you said, I don't miss anything. Like she, right. that's perfect. She puts her head up for me and I get it because, because, well, I'm kind of anal about it too. I just, I don't, I don't like her having messy hair. <laughs> I love it. That's great. It's awesome. Um, yeah, but that's, yeah, I just wanted to, that, like, I see that with people where they just are like, well, the groomer is the only one that, that does this. And I'm like, well, you can, you can step in a little bit here and there. <laughs> And, and I, I think that is definitely something, a bridge that has to be crossed a lot with clients. And it's something that I educate all my new clients on is with the dogs that require homework. Not all dogs do, um, but with the dogs that do, I almost want to make them sign a paper that says they agree to do this or come and take a course with me, you know, and then I'll allow it. <laughs> Like it's my dog or something, but yeah, I know that's stupid, but it's just how I feel sometimes. Um, I would love that. And I'm sure you're just, you know, first of all, you're, you're a rock star. I don't know where you get all of your energy, I guess, just because you exercise so much and that gives you all of your energy because you just do so much, (laughs) but, um, yeah, I, I, I find that the, at least the way I am and everybody is different is that I, if I understand the why of something, I can totally get on board with doing what's required. So if, for example, a groomer or my veterinarian or whoever it may be explains to me, this is why this needs to happen. then I'm, I'm all on it, right? Like show me what I need to do. I'm going to do it now that I understand why If I can't wrap my head around why then I have a hard time following through. (laughs) And I, I feel like that's a hold up a lot of times between the groomer and client communication is that groomers know how it's supposed to be done. They know what needs to be done and they know why. And they just expect the client to take their word for it, you mm-hmm. know. And I understand that to a certain point. But what I've had to take, take a step back at and look at is, okay, this is happening over and over again. So they obviously People, the norm, you know, the, for the norm, the people that aren't groomers, they really, truly don't get it. They don't understand. Mm-hmm. And it's not that they don't want to. It's not that they can't. It's just that they haven't ever been taught. Mm-hmm. So that's when I have to take my grooming hat off and put on my teacher hat and say, hey, why don't you come back? Come back. Let's bring your dog back here. We'll put it on the table and I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to show you why I'm saying what I'm saying. And I want you to see what you're committing to because yeah, you can say till you're blue in the face, I'm going to brush my dog. No, you're not, (laughs) not the way you might brush your dog, 
but you're not going to do it with proper technique and you're not going to do it thoroughly and you're not going to do it properly because you don't know you don't brushing isn't just brushing it there's a lot there's technique to it there's like you said a method to it you know you have a specific you know uh, routine that you do with your dog and a lot of people don't have that so mm -hmm. They just think brushing their dog is taking a brush over the top of the coat. That's not, there's line brushing, especially on the dogs with the, like the poodles or the doodles, you know, you have to lift up each section of hair and brush it and then take the next session down and brush it, take the next session down and brush it. And so that's, you know, way more in depth than just taking a brush over the top of the coat. and being Yeah. Done. I don't know how you would get through their hair if you didn't do that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So they see that. And then I'll put the force dryer on them to blow the hair apart, especially on a matted dog. Cause I want them to be able to see what I'm talking about. Cause you can tell somebody their dog is matted and they're not going to believe you because they brush their dog. Oh, you're going to believe me. Cause I'm going to show you, come on back. And yeah. so I put the dryer on the dog and blow that top part that they've been brushing apart. And so they can see what's underneath that. And it's a solid mat. And they are always blown away by that. Like, holy cow, I didn't even know. I mean, I swear to God, I just brushed them all the way out yesterday. <laughs> okay, but you didn't. Yeah. I mean, I, I appreciate and I always make sure they feel appreciated yeah. for the work that they have done because they have taken the time to do some work. Mm -hmm. They just haven't done it correctly. And it's not their fault. They just don't know. So I have to, you know, swallow my pride and or swallow my ego for a second and you know put myself in their position and and understand they really don't get it they and, and they're not stupid and they're not morons and it's not that they don't want to do the right thing or they don't want to be a bad client they just they need help they need help and understanding and you know they need to know the why like you said um and they're not going to know the why unless I take the responsibility and accountability as a professional and show them what that why is. Mm -hmm. And then we can go from there. I've had lots of successful clients keep their dogs maintained. And then I've had clients that call me the next week and say, nope, not going to do this. Cut the hair. And then I have clients that come in and like to try it. Like, you, know, you go to the dentist and you say, yeah, I've been flossing. Mm -hmm. And you know, you haven't been flossing. Well, yeah, they come in and you say, I've been brushing my dog. And you second, you look at their dog. You're like, you have not been brushing your dog. Not the way that I have told you to brush your dog. <laughs> and so you have to have that honest communication with them. And I've had people walk out and I've had, you know, I've had to tell people you can take your dog home and, and finish, you know, brushing it out and combing out like I've taught you and then bring it back to me and I'll, I'll do the grooming job that you're needing me to do. Um, and they'll do that and they call me, you know, half an hour later and they're like, yeah, I can't do this. Bring the dog back. And then we, you know, we work from there to figure out what we can do to either save the coat or, um, if it's a, you know, a lost cause, then we have to start over and there's just no, no way around that. Um, I've had dog, I've had owners walk out, you know, I've said, if your dog stays here, this is what's happening and they don't accept it and they don't want it. And they, and they, they leave with their dog and I'm okay with that to, you know, because I've done my part, I feel bad for the dog because I don't know what kind of hell they're going to face now, but I can't control that. Um, I know that I've done my part to advocate for them and I've tried to educate that customer. I've had people take their dog to their vet and get an opinion from their veterinarian. Is my dog really so mad and it needs to be shaved? And then they come back and their dog gets shaved because, you know, it's just, I understand why people don't want their dogs shaved, but I don't understand. I, what I struggle with sometimes is communicating with that client in a way that um, shows them grace because I'm like, why, how can you not understand this is going to hurt your dog? And why would you want me to hurt your dog? And why would you want me to go through something like that? You know, I, 
I cry when I'm grooming a shelter dog that, you know, has super matted. Now you want me to torture your dog? Do you know what that does to somebody? Do you know how that makes a groomer feel when you want when you want them to torture your dog and and you're just not seeing it? That's what frustrates me, you know. Yeah. Those kind of clients. The like prioritizing aesthetics over quality yeah. of life. And yeah, that that I don't know how you do that. It's a, it's a, tough, not gonna lie. <laughs> it's a tough situation to be in. Um, but I have learned, you know, over the years through experience different ways of communicating. And sometimes I'm successful and sometimes I'm not. And I, I can only do what I know to do. And I have to be okay with that. You know, I'm always willing to learn something new. I'm always willing to learn a new way of communication or a new way of trying to get a breakthrough with somebody. But if that person doesn't want it, I can't make them want it. You know what I mean? I can try to open their eyes by doing what I know has worked in the past, but sometimes I fail and I hate that, but it's the fact of life. Well, I went into today's podcast expecting this to be kind of purely for client benefit, if if I'm using your terminology, client benefit, pet parent benefit. But I feel like um, so many groomers can benefit from everything that you're saying that I really hope that (laughs) which is a lot of groomers too, Um, because it is it is about, in my opinion, it is about as much as you are an artist, it's also, it's about compassion for the dog. Um, in my mind over and above everything else. And, 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 and learning how to talk to people and communicate without getting defensive and without feeling like, you know, they're not respecting you or whatever, you know, it's because it's not that that's not what's happening. And you have to take your blinders off for a second and figure that out. You're going to be way happier and way more successful if you do. And I'm not going to sit here and say that I haven't always have always been this way because I haven't, I used to be one of those groomers that would get shitty and I'm sorry, that would get (laughs) mad and, um, you know, defensive and my feelings would be heard and how dare them. And, but it's not, that's not what's happening most of the time. I'm going to, not going to say all the time, because there are some jerk faces out there. Yeah. Client wise, <laughs> just, you know, don't want to be nice. And that's, you know, that's when you say goodbye. Um, but I, I have to, I have to take ownership over myself and my part in the situation and show people grace. Mm-hmm. And because I would want the same thing done for me. If I didn't understand something, I don't want somebody to make fun of me and make me feel stupid. If I don't understand something, Mm -hmm. I want somebody to explain it to me and teach me. Mm -hmm. So that's what I try to do. I, I love that. I appreciate that. And thank you for explaining all of that. I know I learned a lot. (laughs) Good. I'm sure there's some groomers that might listen to this that probably want to punch me in the face, but I just, you know, I'm just trying to say what um, what has worked for me over the years and what helps me sleep better at night. And uh, I've had to put a lot more work into it. Like um, I've had to be willing to put work into relationships mm-hmm. and willing to put work into communications and not just work into grooming dogs. The yeah. work has to go everywhere. Yeah. That's actually one of the biggest things that my husband helped me with is improving myself to be able to, at at the end of the day, if I'm struggling with something or if I'm having anxiety and I feel like I just can't, I can't talk to somebody or if I'm too angry, what do I need to do to make sure that that animal gets what they need Mm -hmm. and whatever, however I have to adjust myself to talk to their, their parent, their, their owner, their guardian, then that's like, I have to like go into myself and improve myself to be able to. And so I, I very much appreciate um, what you're saying and, and how you're evolving to help people and their pets. So I have one more question for you. Yeah. And it is totally not animal related. I just sure. decided today that I was going to start doing this with my interviews. Yeah. yeah. If you were stranded on a desert island and you could only take the 
like music with you of one band or artist to listen to for the rest of your life, what would that band or artist be? Oh my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know because I love so many different genres. Like that's where I was too. When somebody, (laughs) I mean, I feel like my favorite genre is probably country music. Um, I would probably have to say Garth Brooks just because he's, you know, he's tried and true, you know, he's just, he's been there for a long time and he's, uh, some of his songs have like the dance, um, love dance, I think is, is it love dance or the dance? I can't remember, but that's like one of my most favorite songs and it makes me cry every time because I relate it to my career with gymnastics and not an actual person <laughs> but um <clears throat> that's a whole nother podcast and <laughs> no you do so many things that's what I was saying I don't know how you get it all done <laughs> I have to stay busy or I get in trouble so <laughs> um so yeah that that and then standing outside the fire those are two of my most favorite songs so Awesome. Well, I know it had nothing to do with the animals. I just decided I'm gonna I'm gonna just it's start it out. It's, it's 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 something you have to think about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for definitely. sure. And I'm I'm one of those people that like I just I love music so much that um I, I feel like there's a soundtrack to everything you do, right? And music brings back memories and it's it's yeah, you're like me where you just really connect to that that the feelings it gives you and I like to dance so anytime I have a song comes on that hits me like that I have to dance and uh I uh I just I don't know that's how I've always been so and I'm taking dancing lessons now which is a lot of fun I saw um the uh dance yeah and um yeah the video you just posted you you put on a dress to start preparing for practicing yeah yeah because I like wearing sweats sweats and my heels to dance in for the (laughs) for (laughs) practice and my instructor was like you know you're gonna be wearing a dress right (laughs) oh yeah okay and I love dresses don't get me wrong I love dressing up and getting all fancy and everything but when I'm working out or practicing I like to be comfortable so but I felt really pretty in that dress (laughs) pretty (laughs) well Kat thank you so much I I learned a lot so I hope everybody listening learns a lot as well and I have definitely a different appreciation for what you do um and I just hope that people take away from this to be more open and to communicate like practice communication with every, not just like, you know, we talk about it all the time that you need to be able to communicate with your kids and your partner and like you need to be able to communicate with everybody in your life. And for me, because my pets are such a big part of my life, any professional I work with that has to do with my pets is a big part of my life. Like that just is what it is for, like you said, so many of your clients are are your friends. Um, And I feel like that's how, like, if, if I can't be friends with my veterinarian, I'm going to find another veterinarian. Like that's, you know, how I am. Yeah. So, um, yeah, like communication is, is, is so important. And if you struggle with it, then for me, like my best advice is that you have to look at what you're doing it for. First of all, it should, you should ultimately do everything for yourself, but if you need to do it for your pets, because they, you know, you are the, you're it for your pet. Like you are your pet's biggest advocate. And if you're not assuming that role, then right. So much can happen. (laughs) And I agree with that a hundred percent. I was just going to say that too, is like groomers are the number one advocate second to the owner. I mean, but some, in some cases we are the number one because an owner doesn't put their hands all over a dog. They don't look directly at the vagina or the butthole. They don't express the anal glands. They don't look into the ears. You know, we find ear infections. We find cancer. We've saved so many lives. I don't care if you have a chihuahua. Taking your dog to a groomer once a month, it's the benefits outweigh just, you know, having a chihuahua because they're, 
we're going to find if something's wrong, we're going to find it before your vet does. And most likely before you do, because we have our hands all over that dog Mm -hmm. and we notice changes in your dog before you do. And we bring them to your attention, um, especially in the older dogs. So I feel like, yes, you are as an owner, you are the number one advocate, but groomers are right up there with you. So, yeah. Oh, I, I, I appreciate that, that because what you said, that that's so true. And, and I know I'm, I'm not, I'm not the average, like I'm, I'm all over my dog. <laughs> Let me tell you, like my dog is so used to being handled and touched and I ev- everywhere, everything, every day, like it's, it's part of my routine at night that I don't even, sometimes I don't even realize I'm doing it. We're sitting yeah. on the couch watching TV and she's right there beside me. And I'm like, during a commercial, I'm, I'm checking her out and I'm looking her over and I'm, you know, touching everything and feeling her legs. And like, that's just, just part of what I do. But I understand that most people do not do that. Yeah. And, um, and that's a role because most people would think like, well, that's my veterinarian's job. Right. But you're only, if you only take your dog to the vet once a year, how are they supposed to, you know, catch anything early enough? Yeah. That makes so much sense. I appreciate it. Yeah. And a lot of times a veterinarian has a specific thing that you're going there for, and they're not going to look at anything else. So if you're a vet, if you're going there for your vaccinations, they're not necessarily going to look inside the ears or wherever, you know, check the anal glands. Whereas your groomer is going to do that every single appointment, every two weeks, every four weeks, every six weeks, whatever it is. Your vet veterinarian is every six months or once a year, however you decide to go. Um, so things are going to be missed, not because they don't care, not because they're not good at your job, but because they're not groomers and they're not looking at every inch of that dog's body unless you tell them to. And then, yeah, that's a whole nother appointment. <laughs> right. Yes, absolutely. Well, I, I know I've learned so much and I have a, a new appreciation. So thank you very, very much. Oh, of course. Yeah, and I so enjoyed chatting with you. I hope to see you again. And um, yeah, any parting words, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and end it with that. <laughs> I don't have anything. And, um, but yeah, I'm always open to questions. So if anybody wants to, message me on Facebook or follow me on Instagram and message me there. That's um, totally open to that. I'm happy. Yeah, what to are your handles where they can find you at platinum paws? At- uh, platinum paws on Facebook. Uh, make sure that you're choosing the one that's in Indiana. There's a few different platinum paws, uh, mm-hmm. Carmel, Indiana. Um, and then my handle on Instagram is the ninja groomer. Um, and then I also have a TikTok, which is also the Ninja Groomer, but that's not necessarily grooming stuff. <laughs> Sometimes it's a lot of workout stuff and dancing and all that. So, <laughs> awesome. well, I'm sure there are people that are interested in all of that as well. So, <laughs> all of that everywhere. And um, yeah, again, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you. And with that, give guys, give your pets some extra love from me and from Kat this week. Yeah. And I will talk to you next week. Thank you. Ow, ow.